Hi, and welcome back to sciencevideos.org. This week we're speaking to Andrew Strauss about his recent work on decapitations in Brazil. So, Andrew, um, could you tell us a little bit about the paper, please? Sure. So, uh, the decapitation case was found in central, east central Brazil, in an archaeological region that's called Lagoa Santa, which is a, a region that's well known for archaeologists, paleontologists, uh, since the first half of the 19th century. And with the work of this Danish naturalist called Peter Loon, who was uh, looking for evidence of the coexistence of man and, and megafauna uh, back there. Uh, the site is called Lapa do Santo. And I would say one of the important things about Lapa do Santo is precisely that this is a new site in this region that has been uh, extensively studied in the past. But Lapa do Santo uh, was an exception to that. So it was a kind of a, a virgin site. And this allowed us to uh, apply more uh, modern excavation and documentation techniques to, to study the Lagoa Santa archaeological record. So what was found was this de decapitation. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the position of the hands? Um, yeah, so uh, it, it was burial 26. Um, and this, this is already important in the sense that it was not a single decapitation. This decapitation is actually part of a broader a mortuary context where we found several uh, burials. They are all dated more or less between 9 and 10,000 years uh, BP. And burial 26 is ended up, it was a, a case of decapitation. So basically, uh, we realized that in the field, after two or three days of uh, the exhuma exhumation process, when we realized the body was not there, so it was quite uh, straightforward to, to figure out was a decapitation because the, the, the bones were fully articulated and, and the body was not there. So we found the, the cranial and the mandible in articulation, the first six cervical vertebrae also articulated. And then on top of that, they also amputated both hands and they laid uh, the hands over the face of these, uh, at that point ahead because the soft tissues were still present and in a very particular way. So the left hand was laid over the right side of the face with the fingers pointing down, this is in direction to the chin, and then the left hand in an opposite direction with, uh, in, in the left side of the face with uh, the fingers pointing up. So in a kind of uh, dualistic opposition uh, configuration. And so was this something you think they would did to their enemies or is this sort of, like, yeah, I understand it was a male, is this a local man um, or is it an enemy that's maybe attacked them and they mutilated body so let's say in the in the area of decapitology i mean i'm kidding there's no such a thing but when you find a case of decapitation in your ecological context one of the first thing you, you you want to determine is of course if this is a is a is, is in the context of interpersonal violence or instead if this is in the context of a, a ritual or an answer to veneration and as is always the case with your ecological record is not as straightforward to determine uh, these things and you never have uh, a definite answer or a real formal hypothesis testing uh, approaches. It, this is not possible. But several lines of evidence uh, together uh, make us decide for an uh, interpretation that is not, this decapitation was not about uh, a violence, was not about uh, the, the, the punitive behavior. On the contrary, this was probably uh, part of a, 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 a ritual uh, prescriptions that were applied to many members of the group. And this, these ritual prescriptions were basically passing through an emphasis in the reduction of the human body, of the, the human corpse, uh, as part of those rituals. And the captation was one possible way in which this practice were expressed, but not the only one. So together with other evidence, such as the chronometric analysis, the Strontian isotope analysis, uh, the, the, the scenario that we postulated, that we propose, is one of a, a ritualized decapitation after death has occurred. So, and, and this, is, this is probably uh, important to be very clear. We're not proposing that, they, that this guy was decapitated as a uh, causa mortis, right? So he was already dead when they removed. And this is interpretation because uh, we cannot actually be sure if the cutting process took place immediately after, during, or before uh, the the decomposition of uh, soft tissues. So it's more like a sign of respect rather than sort of like it's not a mode of killing the person. It's something that's happened to them after death. Yeah. So it's not the enemy. It's a member of the group. So.
So this is not a, like a trophy head, which is also a common thing you, you find both ethnographically and in the archaeological record, both in South America and outside the continent. And uh, so we don't think in trophy taking. We also don't think it's like this more European uh, approach to uh, decapitation, where we basically decapitate people to intimidate them and make sure they were not a rebel. And, you know, no, we, we believe this was a part of a ritual, a funerary ritual. And therefore, yes, definitely more in the field of the respect than in the field of the, the, the aggression. The, the, the exact reasons behind that is just not, uh, is, is beyond the reach of, of, of our uh, capability to, to, to determine that. We, we can reconstruct behavior, yes, but uh, you know, mental states is just beyond uh, our possibilities. And um, is it similar to any other ritual um, decapitation in other countries, or is this a, a sort of a once found? So if you think of the decapitation itself, this very specific practice, yes, you have decapitation all over the world, I would say, the, the very common human behavior, uh, but for a very different uh, purpose, right? So any attempt to find a universal explanation for this practice is it, it, not taking us anywhere. In, in South America specifically, so we have a kind of more regional context, and this is one of the points of the paper. The oldest case of decapitation we had before this one was around 4,000 4, years ago in Peru, right? So this is uh, our case is making the decapitation at least twice uh, older in South America, you know, bringing the origins of this practice uh, much uh, further back in time. And then also the geographic dispersion, because most, if not all, of the decapitation cases that we have in the archaeological record of South America, not that in the graphic one, but the archaeological record, they're mostly in the Andean region, and they are somehow associated with those uh, later uh, societies that developed later, you know, like the Moche, the Chimu, where actually decapitation, I would say, was a very important uh, part of their 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 life and their their cosmology. So yes, the decapitation is everywhere. We, you, we have ethnographic examples uh, in South America. The most uh, known are the Hivaro, uh, the, the, the shrinking heads of the Hivaro, and uh, the Munduruku in Brazil. You know, in the past, not not anymore, but in the past, they they, they used to practice this. In a more in a fashion that was more related to to head hunting perhaps, but even there, if you look closer, you see there is a lot of elements that are not necessarily associated with uh, aggression and 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 something necessarily bad. On the contrary, they are always associated with fertility and and, and success in, in in hunting. So it's it's not always it's, it's, there is no only one single straightforward interpretation for this practice. So, in regards to the preservation of this skeleton, um, was it very well preserved? Um, is it likely you're going to find others nearby? Yeah, so it's super well preserved. And this is probably something that made the region of Lagoa Santa so uh, important in the scenario of uh, first Americans, especially if you're interested in, in the skeletons. And uh, there are many reasons why you would be interested in the skeletons. You know, you can study uh, biological aspects, but also behavioral aspect and also cultural aspects with the, the, the archaeology of the funerary practice. And of course, the skeletons are more fragile than, let's say, uh, stone tools, and they don't preserve as easily. And when you go for uh, skeletons that are older than 8.5 thousand years ago, in the entire New World, it's really rare to find them, actually. You don't find them everywhere. And I would say that Lagoa Santa is the only place in the entire continent where you have three things that happen at the same time. And this is, you have old skeletons, I mean, older than 8.5 thousand BP. You have uh, a, a many skeletons, so you no know, abundant number of skeletons, and super well-preserved skeletons. In other, other locations of the continent, you do have some old skeletons, like the, the Cloth's Child in, in the US, but it's only one. And in, in other regions, perhaps uh, like uh, Colombia, you also have many skeletons, and, and they are old, but they're more fragmented. So having hundreds of early Holocene well-preserved skeletons, as far as I know, the only place you find that is, is Lagoa Santa. And this is why this region is so central for those interests in the skeletal uh, remains of the early Holocene groups in America. So what's next for this research and this work? So I think th this is a good question in the sense that also allows us to say, of course, our project, we are not like a, we're not looking after decapitation. This was a fortuitous find that uh, happened to have uh, a kind of a broad uh, uh, coverage by media and stuff. But this is part of, a, of our broader archaeological project that 
I told you, for the last 170 years, research in this region of Brazil was focused on trying to prove the coexistence of man and the extinct megafauna, and on the topic of the crinomorphology of the first Americans, which is uh, this two versus one uh, main biological component model, which are very important questions, no doubt, but there are other aspects of uh, the archaeological record that deserves to be investigated. So this project that started in 2011 wants precisely to look at Lagoa Santa region with this more behavioral uh, perspective, if you want. And this is what we, are, we were doing and that we'll keep doing. Um, and the ex excavations are uh, ongoing. Since the discovery of burial 26 uh, in 2007, we are now already in burial 37. And, and then we have all the analysis that you can imagine from uh, DNA, uh, isotopes, the fauna, craniometric analysis. Uh, uh, there will be now coming a paper on formation process showing how these, these sites are actually uh, formed by an intense accumulation of ash. So it's basically four meters of ash, anthropogenic ash, that is accumulated in, in less than 3,000 years. So this, this is a quite an impressive accumulation rate. So there, this is the same site where the oldest uh, rock art of, of the New World was found. This is published in 2012 paper in PLOS 1, 2. So there's many uh, elements from, from Lapa do Santo that deserve to be uh, investigated and studied. Wow, this sounds like a really fascinating project. Um, I'm really interested to see more results as it continues. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll put the link to the paper below this video. Um, nice. Yeah, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you for uh, inviting me to, to, to this interview. Thank you. Thank you for coming.